Welcome to the presentation of the results of the study of Belarus National Identity in 2022. Our presentation today is organized by the Press Club and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. My name is Anton Rolov, and I'll be moderating our event today. The author of the study and the main speaker today is Filip Bikanov, an independent sociologist. Filip, welcome. Inad Korshinov and Alicia Rudnik will be guest speakers today and uh, the reviewers of uh, Philip's work. I remind you that the working languages of today's event are Belarusian, Russian and English. So please, uh, you can ask your questions in any of these languages. In case it's easier, we, we can do it through video or through chat. We'll be happy to link you to our discussion. In case it's easier for you to listen to us in English, in uh, Russian or Belarusian, please select the Belarusian channel on the Zoom. I will start with a speech of Christopher Forst, uh, representative of the Friedrich Ebert, um, Ebert Foundation for Belarus and the head of the regional office called Dialogues in Europe. Christopher, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll switch to English and welcome also from my side to all our guests. This is already the second launch of our study on Belarusian identity in 2022. It was previously presented at the Minsk Forum in Berlin, which uh, FES had the honor to host on the 1st of December. We hope that this online launch will allow us to get a bit, go a bit more in depth. Uh, Philip will have more time to present some of the findings and we'll have more time for Q&A. As Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Germany's oldest political foundation committed to the values of freedom, solidarity and justice, we are happy to support this study on Belarusian identity. In our opinion, identity can be a very political question. I think some of the findings very much reflect this point. Uh, we think that this is a very important but also very complex issue which has manifold dimensions and it's important to understand these dimensions when trying to win over Belarusians politically. Um, boldly said, not everything can be explained by white, red, white, or red and green. So in other words, you should understand your target audience well when coining political messengers. Uh, in order to do this, you should avoid oversimplification. And this study may lay some sort of foundation for that. Um, it may also help an international audience to get a more differentiated view of Belarusian society and act vis-a-vis -vis Belarus in an as suitable as possible manner. Quite importantly, Philip is also able to show some trends through comparisons with previous research and might be able to follow up on this and get more profound data in the future as well, especially uh, trends with regards to the link between national consciousness and the ongoing sociopolitical confrontation in the Belarusian society, as well as the role of uh, Belarusian foreign policy preferences and uh, as well as Belarusian uh, foreign policy preferences and the role they play in the national consciousness are interesting for us and hopefully for you as well. Um, today's launch, I think, will also give Philip a bit more time to elaborate on the methodology. There are always many questions with regards to the sociological research under such difficult conditions as we are currently facing them in autocratic Belarus, and I think it's important to have time and space to discuss them. And I'm also looking forward to the expert comments from Lesia Rutnik and Gennady Karshunov, who have both been involved in attempts to understand the Belarusian identity themselves and are very qualified to give us their thoughts on the current developments and the clustering which Philip will present. Um, last but not least, I would also use the chance to advertise another research which is funded by VS, uh, the Belarus Change Tracker, the launch of the third edition uh, of this quarterly report, which both Philip and Hans have contributed to as well, will take place online this Friday. I will post the link to the previous second edition in the chat so that you can get an idea of it if you do not know it yet. Um, if you're interested, please look out for the announcements for upcoming launch or check our AVS Digital Library. At the end of this week, you will find the publication there. And the identity study we're launching today can also be found there. So I'd like to thank Philip and his team uh, once again, as well as the Press Club Belarus. I'm looking forward to the discussion of our fresh data and the analysis now, and also to the expert comments and, of course, to your questions. Um, and let me, of course, also thank my colleagues, especially Valeria Klemenko, who put a lot of work on this from our side. Over to you. Thank you.
Дякую великий Кристофер. Ну и. Thank you much, Christopher. Philip, the floor is yours. Let's start with the presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you for coming to listen to us. Thank you for joining us today. First of all, uh, while I'm uh, sharing my presentation on the screen, I want to tell you about, uh, again, to thank uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation for the support, for what uh, they help us uh, research things like that, like, like National Agency Belarus. This is very important, very essential. Not many people and organizations are ready to support this kind of research. Again, once again, thank you, Christopher Forst, the head of this foundation, Valeria Klimenko, who is with us today. Without her, today's event would not have been possible. She established communication between us and the foundation. It was a, a, a fine and quick connection. I would like to thank the team and that uh, edited this research results. And they are working from Kiev and they were busy working on our research report, particularly during the cutoffs of the electricity. In order for us to be able to work today, people in Kyiv uh, worked without electricity. Thanks for, once again to that team. A few more things before we start. First, the language issue needs to be sorted out first. The report is currently available in Russian and in English. I will be presented, presenting it in Belarusian although the test and the slide will be in Russian. There will be a translation into the Belarusian language next year. Why we decided to put off the Belarusian language um, part, it's explained by the fact, but by the fact but that our team members are in Kyiv who understand Belarusian, but cannot edit it. Therefore, our report is, has been translated into English and presented also into Russian. Let's not, uh, therefore, let's not uh, go back to it for the moment. And now let's discuss the text. Just like Christopher said, with the uh, Ebert Foundation. This has been the third wave done by quantitative methods. The first wave took place before the election of 2020 using the focus group. Now we continued uh, with uh, 1,279 respondents. We collect the data from uh, mid-August to beginning of September. As usual, it's online research. Those abolitions live in the urban area, have access to the internet. The sample uh, was made similar to the structure of the Belarusians living in online who are 18 plus. We tried to make this sample uh, using the sex, age, and other characteristics. Then we also included the level of education. Christopher touched this topic a little. A few more words about how we can research the conduct such research in 2022. Mr. Alessio, unfortunately, we have to mute you because you're interfering. 
How can we research this topic? The quantitative research is easier to do uh, using online methodology because it, the online approach gives more opportunities because face-to-face -face approach is not possible because otherwise we would all, would all get uh, in, in, in prison. Interviewers and the respondents would be in trouble. The uh, telephone also can be used, but the fear factor is in place because all uh, telephones are, are registered to your passport. So receiving the honest and open answers is difficult. We're left with online respondent, respondents. With time, uh, the situation is not getting better. The fear factor is still in place. Here, we're not asking people what kind of flag you're supporting. We added the, uh, the button called add uh, fast forward this question or avoid this question. Many people did that because the fear factor is still in place in Belarus. It gave us the understanding that the research has sensitive questions that probably distort part of the answers, making them more neutral. People are opting for safe option. We need to understand the online survey is not a representative uh, approach because uh, because the chance of getting into uh, our sample is not the same for everyone. Thus, this distribution in terms of percentage cannot uh, may not be 100% the same as they are in the reality. If we say there is a 15%, group of 15%, we need to understand that, in fact, there could be more or less of them. Online survey may be different from a regular approach because online users are more uh, educated, more active, because they somehow found information about this online panel. I wouldn't say these differences are stark, but uh, the distribution may still be different. Also, I've already heard some criticism, so I must mention this. The quantitative study and approach, they simplify the situation. We cannot describe the whole situation, every case, every person. Some people find one thing important while others find something else. We cannot describe identity in the full spectrum, the full range that it can include. In particular, the names of the segments have super describing emotions. They are simplified in order to, it's done in order to better understand what we see and to see how different uh, the responses are coming from people who are similar to each other in many ways. Okay, let's continue. First, we'll talk about the national projects in Belarus. How did we divide our society? For three years, we've used the scale dividing Belarusians into three factors, attitude to the national, like a Belarusian, uh, national indifferent, and the Russian Soviet. The Belarusian one is described through the sympathy to the attitude to the Belarusian language, first and foremost. Uh, 
Е, того, що ми називаємо so what we call national idea like white, red, white flags and everything connected with it the historical views play also an important role here the Russian Soviet factor at the same time shows the proximity to closeness to the Soviet and to some degree the Russian element. The pro Soviet um, element does not mean that it's um, mostly nostalgia, it doesn't mean that they uh, don't have the Belarusian element which is shown in them. For these people, some of them, Belarusian language is very important, but they view Belarus as an idea a bit different, the national indifferent. A people find the national idea not characteristic, not inherent to them. So the world picture doesn't contain this element. They survive and they live fine without it. In the past, we used to call them cosm cosmopolitan. They have some characteristics. Um, they prefer to be to be called on the citizens of the world. So we've received five segments. The conscious, those are associated with uh, strong attachment to the Belarusian component. The Belarusian, the Russian Soviet, those are two main foundations of the national project. The Belarusian national romantic and the Russian Soviet. Next comes the the segment which is somewhere in between still somewhere in between it has the features of both narratives more often they opt for neutral responses the indifferent one are the people for whom the national element is not particularly important, neither is the Belarusian Soviet. Compared with the previous years, we have singled out this new segment, the Russified. They identify themselves as the Russians. And the Russians that made it into the indifferent segment are different to all other segments. We have singled out a special segment of this kind. What happens to them from the point of view of identity? who can be considered a Belarusian. For the conscious ones, culture is the main thing that differentiates them. Another one is that they feel themselves Belarusian. For, for the Soviets, again, it's different. The nationally indifferent ones I am. Um, I'll tell you more about this during the Q and A session. I don't have much time left. Um, for this group, the Belarusian language is important. More, I mean, for the uh, conscious segment. It's interesting to know that this segment.
identify themselves in a different way, but they have similarities, particularly when we look at the, the conscious ones and the Soviet ones. Here, you see, uh, it's, uh, it would be great to have a, to compare them, made comparison. But at the identity level, it's not the best approach because these are people who love their, love their country, but in a different way. We see here the Soviet person and the Slavic person are different in their eyes, even though the consciousness are the Slavic ones. They don't really consider this tri-Slavic approach relevant. But both of them very often feel themselves as patriots. The love for the motherland is inherent, inherent, inherent in them. Another important situation uh, and funny situation when the many people have left and the Russian diaspora is uh, received more and more people who are persecuted in Belarus. And the narrative they like is basically banned in Belarus. Here we see a good example of the differences of version nar narratives of tri-unity. The conscious ones associate themselves, see themselves as a separate people with their own culture and history. And the rest wide ones like to say that Belarusians, Ukrainians and Russians are part of the tri-union unity. So the attitude to Russia has certain influence on the Belarusian national narratives, even among the Soviet people, pro-Soviet people. The locality of identity in Belarus shows that the conscious have a more cosmopolitan approach. Why? Because the citizen of the world and citizen of Europe uh, can be called a feature of cosmopolitanism. They are characteristic of the, the conscious segment. Here we see that the, the segment of the indifferent very often seen as the person living in their own region, their own town. The national indifference uh, is said, is described by the author, is con compared with the people living in Silesia, who identify themselves with their own whereabouts. And we see some characteristics of it in people living in Belarus. During the census, people are not asked with what they identify themselves. And it's very difficult to speak about your identity in the atomized state like Belarus. The Soviet ones uh, contradict when uh, juxtapose uh, their views to those of European, pro-European ones. A few words about the Belarusian language. When we talk about the national identity, it's Im impossible not to talk about the language. We see here that the Belarusian language is an important element of identity for two segments. First and foremost, it is the, the conscious segment and a bit less for the Soviet ones. Why I'm saying that the Soviet segment is not that bad. The people who 
feel closer to the Russian, to the Soviet project. I see that uh, they were the target group of the Lukashenko narratives. It turned out that these people consider Belarusian culture something important for themselves, even though they feel the unity with their Soviet past and the Russian now more than they do with the West. Belarusian culture is still an important thing for them. We can see it in using the example of the language, because there are people who are emerging was somewhere in the middle, and the indifferent and the Russified uh, find the Belarusian culture not important. So important to say a few words about uh, when we talk about identity. We saw the connection between social conflict and identity and the foreign policy approaches. We have divided the society into four segments, active audience of both kinds, active audience of the state, media, active audience of the non-state media and inactive audience. Here we see the big differences as well. The active audience of non-state media uh, made, make, makes a, the biggest part of the conscious ones. As the group with the Soviets, uh, and the emerging ones, we see the, what happens with them as to the rest of it. If you look at the top five, When we see the top five media consumed, we see that the significant part of the Belarus society is still in the Russian media space or the state, Belarusian state or the Russian media space like in TV. Belarus is an important channel for many people. While the conscious ones watch Belsat and independent media. It's good that uh, with others is the Yandex onliner.by is the media that they consume. As a researcher, I can see that very often people consume a lot of Russian TV. A lot is written in the, a lot is written in the report, but we can see that uh, it's not a secret. We have a conflict in our state connected with the political preferences. It has to do with the revolution of 2020. We divide the uh, society into four groups, depending on the level of trust or mistrust to the state institutions and people who represent the culture, the, the state, and uh, trust and mistrust coming from people who fight with this state, like independent media, or the people who can be called the political prisoners or those who have left the country due to depression. The analysis of the res such responses of gives us no, four different groups, ardent uh, supporters, ardent opponents, and people who rather support or rather oppose. It depends a lot here to uh, the, the majority of the uh, ardent opponents consist of the conscious ones, while the pro proponents include the mostly pro-Soviet people. You can see it by the, judging by the color. 
not all these people are proponents of the Lukashenko's policy. They would rather be the proponents of the regime. Ardent, it's unclear if they're ardent or not. In other words, it's not as simple as it may seem. They emerge once who are brother opponent opponents. We didn't ask people such questions uh, before 2020, but we saw, judging by the um, their answers, that people who were in favor of being uh, cr critical about democ democracy including the legal issues. They didn't really care much about that. Very often they said that this is not, it's less important. And then Belarus is not really very often observed. We see here that many people from the emergent group are prone to mistrust the regime, prone to mistrust the regime. We see also that this conflict has a value time mention, we singled out five different factors. Uh, the big report has more information on this, but I can show you the big difference between the, the conscious and the Soviet one, how they view Belarus. For the conscious ones, have uh, tolerance to the state violence much lower than uh, than um, with others with other groups and for them the democratic values are the most important ones and uh, if we compare them with the, so the group of the soviets pro-soviet ones the values are totally different the emergent ones is like in a segment in between Uh, there's an interesting connection saying that the people for whom the romantic project is uh, to more liking, I'm sort of, it's a wrong picture. The set of contradictory values and the difference in political, not preferences, but uh, the fact that some people suffer in this state and others not so much, leads to the situation where the identity, the feeling of connection with this or that model, identity is connected with the fact whether people feel Belarus is their own state. We see that the, the conscious ones show that the major direction or of the state is not important because they don't feel they belong to the state. It can be seen in, um, by other surveys and research, particularly Chatham House wrote about this. We see that the narrative that the Belarusian state takes care of uh, their own people. means that the Belarusian authorities are trying to delete a big part of people living in this state. Please be brief, we don't have much time left. A few words about the foreign policy dimension. We asked people about the views on international unions uh, the most popular view is the is the neutrality. The war led to the differences between the what people answered last year and the answer today. And the 
many people have left, particularly those who were against the union between Belarus and Russia. We also can see that the foundation of the pro-European support is linked with various groups. But the emergent ones have the major part of them made of neutral opinions. When we ask people, uh, when we ask people to select the pro-EU or pro-Russian option, we see that the neutral position is more in favor of the pro-European choice. Why? Because the neutral position and pro-European choice is a pragmatic choice. The pro-European choice is based on the fact that when people are asked, would you like to work, uh, live in the EU, they say that's a lot of high, high quality of life and a lot of work and so on. The BIS of 2015 noted that in their research, the same thing. And pro-Russian choice is not really pragmatic. It's something um, full of inertia. They said that we are brothers and sisters. We need to be together while the people are opting for the pro-EU choice, say that the, they like the salaries poor. A few words about integration. We have increased support of integration, but it's still not the majority. Among those who support integration, there are people who cannot understand, cannot define what integration is. When I ask them in particular, whether you want to get united with Russia, there are less than 10% who support this option, which means that integration is not really popular as an idea. And the connection with other segments is the same. Media consumption plays an important role here, as I said, asking the people which party, which side do you support in the war, Ukraine or Russia, we see that non-state media support the Ukrainian side, the state media and the Russian media support the Russian side. It has to do with the inert attitude and view of the Russia and Belarus. What are the conclusions? Three points here. There are several nationality projects. One of them Belarusian National Romantic and the Soviet. And the pro-Russian ones are less educated usually. They say that they don't feel Belarus is their home. I don't know what to do about this. How it happened is still an open question. And a big part of this society do not make this choice in favor of this or that approach. And the nationally indifferent people are the, somewhere in between. They're the emergent ones. The identity schism and split shows that the, the authorities is doing, are doing everything, everything uh, to ban uh, everything that is that the conscious ones like. We see people get arrested in the streets for talking Belarusian, for speaking Belarusian. 
it's clear that the, the idea of this social conflict is based on the fact that the two of this national project, I mean, the, the Russia, the, the, the Soviet ones and the national ones, they view it in a different way. And now the state is not making any balance between them. The state is simply supporting one state and the root of the social conflict means that some people want to change the system while others do not want this transformation because they like this the country and they believe some other country would be worse for them. And the foreign policy choice also affects the situation. The majority is more pragmatic ones. Pragmatic. The pro-Russian choice and the choice in favor of the unity with Russians is also existent. And with the split that we have is uh, multifaceted, is based on the values, based on identity differences. Even Lukashenko disappears, if Lukashenko disappears tomorrow, the people who like Belarus, where they have been living for 25 years or more, I mean, since Lukashenko has come to power, they like this Belarus, they love this Belarus, and uh, there are quite a few of them, there are a lot of them. Even if Svetlana Dikhanovska comes to power tomorrow, the challenges to make uh, Belarus a single home for everyone will be really tough. Thank you, Philip. Let's uh, now give floor to the speakers. I, uh, Alicia, please, I know that you uh, assessed Philip's work. Thank you, Philip. I know that it's very difficult to fit everything that you um, have found in, in this small presentation, but I need to react to the things that I liked or disliked or have some proposals about. First and foremost, considering compared with the previous year, this research did not include, does not uh, consider the differences between the previous research, even though the changes may not be very positive. This also affected the segmentation that we see in today's research, the changed names. It's not only about names, but also about the essence. I think needs need, needs to be noted and highlighted. This time, Philip noted the methodological challenges con connected with the difficulties of uh, uh, serving respondents, like, like a fear factor and some reasons for non-answers. Also, the data interpretation is important. The national direction requires more attention, which means that the, there are more people who call themselves Belarusians and consider others to be Belarusians based on the fact that the person considers themselves Belarusians and not on the presence of the Belarusian passport. It has to do with the fact that um, many people leave Belarus, but also has to do with the war and desire to keep the distance with other nations, particularly uh, the nations currently labeled as aggressors. More often, uh, in immaterial values or intangible values can also be considered as uh, something that marks the conscious ones. The conscious ones became the target for repression and they were forced to leave Belarus. 
the conflict between the Soviet ones and the conscious ones that uh, was highlighted by Philip is a sad thing and it confirms the polarization we see in the Belarusian society. It is also confirmed by the res results and conclusions of other surveys and other research. Looking at how the understanding of the national idea changed, how the segments were divided, I would like to note the fact that, that some uh, approaches can be united or joined. One of the theses that uh, the respondents uh, were offered to reply to was the attitude to the Belarusian language and its presence in the sphere of education. And I thought that the focus on the Belarusian language could be a little bit wider, particularly some questions could be changed. For example, the thesis that the Belarusian language is beautiful, I think, uh, is not easy to describe. When I, even if I call the language beautiful, it doesn't mean that I want it to be uh, supported by the state and developed further. Means that. In other words, this wider understanding of the national made the research more detailed ones. Another methodological questions I had uh, was about the attitude of respondents uh, to various structures, followed by the argumentation. I didn't see that there were some state and non-state structures, why it does it like Lukashenko or Tikhanovsky, for example. I know why it could have happened, but it's interesting to see how it happened. I see that I'm running out of time. So I mentioned two other points. The first one is that we didn't see on the slides, but it is present in the report. I would like to uh, focus uh, the attention of journalists on that. The presentation of how the media co is consumed, we see that non-state media is the only source of news information only for the one segment, for the conscious ones. And uh, this is a worrying trend that needs to be reflected upon. Uh, possibly it may mean that independent media need to know how to work with the audience of the emergent ones or the indifferent ones because of the five sources that various segments use we see that the, the place of independent media is quite small i was also surprised by the figure of the figures of in belarusians being intolerant who think that homosexuality should be punished this overlaps with the data presented by the chatham house where two years ago they noted that 26% of Belarusian urban dwellers that uh, homosexuality should not be approved by uh, the this, this society. So I would really like to learn more about this. I'll uh, note, note, note uh, one more thing. It looks like the majority of Belarusian citizens, the importance of the Belarusian national idea is quite low. So. Uh, they need to be it need to be replaced by the elements of culture that can be used at the same time using the they're using the products of Russian culture but they're not ready to um, get together with Russia at the state level it means that Belarusians are trying to uh, use the elements of culture to deal further their culture but it's worth remembering that it doesn't uh, it's a positive trend, but it has nothing to do with the approach of the state. Even though many people consume the products of the, the Russian media space, 
I think it's a quite a positive trend overall. Also, if you don't have time to read the report, I suggest you watch the, and look at the graphs, particularly if you're an expert or a journalist. It's a very deep and detailed research. Thank you very much. I want to give floor to Gennady Korshinov. Gennady, please be brief because we don't have much time left. Thank you. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, the foundation, for making this research possible. It's not a one off uh, approach, which is great and improves the results of the research. Thank you, Philip and his team, because indeed the research turned out to be uh, interesting. Um, comprehensive. Uh, what I particularly liked, there are a lot of things to argue about. There are some points that I found interesting. However, this uh, doesn't belittle uh, the research because any interpretation of the data is a model. There are some terms that are, I found interesting, and it's, the, it's very hard to please everyone. For example, the factors of patriotism like uh, material and non-material. I would suggest that you think about to use the other words, like the citizenship, the primary ones, and uh, the achievable ones, those that we choose and those that we fight for, because I believe that through this we could uh, show the concept of the struggle for independent identity. Philip, at the end of this presentation, told us that uh, that the state is trying to destroy the conscious identity and those who opt for it need to fight for it. This is the next, the second point. What, why are people considering this or that geopolitical approach? I would also suggest that we would consider not the pragmatic and elements, but also I suggest that we talk about the irrational attitude to this approach and the traditional ones, because the pragmatic element is in both parts, but the one thing is has been traditional and for many years. Another thing is, is the product of the rational choice. This is something else. One more thing, which I think is uh, crucial and can be seen in other assessments. Uh, we really don't pay enough attention to the middle. It's, of course, beneficial to work with the uh, polls, and, and these polls, they really fit very well into all the models. When we say that the two major models of the identity, the national romantic and the Soviet ones, it's understandable. That these two models are the products of, of the mo modern history. But today we're living in the postmodernist era. And I've, I've had this thought for a long time that 
the Belarusians uh, a postmodernist nation. Thus, we didn't manage to create a modernist nation where people spoke about local identity. I don't remember the page, but I, I believe that that's a very fitting considering, considering the horizontal identity that uh, is in contradiction with models that include the fitting into big narrative. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a romantic or the Soviet narrative. It's still aggressive. And uh, it involves the fact that uh, in, the, in the middle, both in the geopolitical and political approach, we saw in, in 2020 was the civil revolution, not the political revolution. The white, red, white flag in 2020 became, was not connected with the Belarusian language, it was a symbol of protest. Also, I have a question. Do we really pay enough attention to the third project, the project of neutrality? the geopolitical neutrality, the, the project of molding of the civil nation and the postmodernist identity. I, I believe that overall, this all will be better to consider in one approach outside the binary positions of the national, the Soviet, and East and West. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Let's have uh, the question from the chat. Philip, why do you think you have more pessimism about the support of Belarusians of the war? Your results uh, do not coincide with uh, your colleagues, particularly those of uh, Mr. Vardamatsky. Thank you very much. I, uh, Jurgen has just wrote an article about this using the clickbait uh, title, like Bikano against Estepenia or something like that. I don't remember what Andrei Petrovich exactly wrote because it doesn't really make his report public. But I think. I think Rehora Stepenia had an attitude to the military actions of Russians in Ukraine. This is a question when something like that, what do you think of the uh, military actions of Russia in Ukraine? And we asked uh, in consideration of which side do you support? The word selection is not the best, but it's a technical limitation that I had to face because the online panels do not want to touch upon the war issue in, in any way. They're very similar to Belarusians in this respect. My question was about uh, which side do you support in the war? And I guess for Damaskia. Also ask people about the attitude. In my case, there was more support for Russia, but considering what we see in attitude to Russia and overall and what it stems from, the mechanism of this choice. I, I believe that this support is at the level of, uh, it may sound cynical, I don't think so myself, but 
this is like a support of a football team because Belarusians mostly come across the war in the media effect. They don't see it, they only watch it through the screen and through the conduct of this or that media outlet. Again, it has to do with the identity choice. And here we see the choice in favor of Russia by inertia. People are saying so, that they're supporting Russia because they are prone to supporting Russia in almost anything, be it football match or something like that. While Ukraine is something, a country which the majority of Belarusians don't know much about that uh, has left this tri-unity and many people think it's like a, something incomprehensible and so to support Ukraine, you need to have more information to make more effort to know more about what's happening because the state Russian and Belarusian narratives that would not provide this information. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Philip. Next question, Philip. Could you describe respondents who are actively using the both state and non-state media? In each group, uh, there are about a third of them. What are these people? Considering the fact that Belarusians have divided into groups, I don't know their social characteristics. But it's a very, very good question. We basically forgot about this. But these are people from the political point of view, they're in the middle who have not decided yet which camp to join. They're probably less educated, even though I'm not sure it's the fact. Thank you. What the, the conscious think about the state and the national idea? How do they relate? 0 0.39 is the smallest figure, in, which means that some tolerance is present there, but it's much less than with others. And the support for democracy is the biggest here. These are relative numbers. These are all relative numbers that allow us to compare segments between each other using this or that factor. In other words, the support for democracy is negatively con connected with the intolerance to the state repression. Next question, did you analyze the group of people who uh, this decided not to participate in this survey? I don't have any uh, information about the demographics. We have an understanding of the completion rate, how many people finished the survey. 88%. Last year it was 84%, and in 2020 it was 86 On average, in the online panel, the figures are 85 to 87, something like that. In other words, the people who do not finish this survey or drop out of this show that 
the dropout is not the most important factor. When we added the the button to skip the question, we saw that many people are afraid to answer the question. So we have some distortions, but they're connected with the fact that the people uh, would probably opt for the safe answer. Would say that so we openly saying that the fear factor does influence this we don't know how much but this drop out is not the main factor here particularly in this research thank you everyone for the presentations I would like to remind you that on the 16th of December, we have the presentations of the third Belgian change tracker. I would like to welcome you there to invite you to the event. Please subscribe to the Press Club channel on YouTube and till next time. Thank you.